think you know Adolf Hitler? You've never seen him like this before. Hitler's contemporaries, from his birth in Braunau to his death in the bunker, authentically flesh out the picture. Who was Hitler? Hitler neither finished school nor had any vocational training. He occasionally lived in homeless shelters or on the street. He refused to pursue a regular job. To this day, it seems inexplicable that he could come to power. Out of nowhere, Hitler became the Führer, leader of the German Reich, one of the most powerful men of the 20th century. Starting an inferno that engulfed the world and brought death to millions of people. The nation worshipped him and followed him blindly into the abyss. But during his lifetime, he kept his origins and his life secret. No one should know how or who he was. Fascinating and oppressive accounts from companions, friends and enemies, as well as the most extensive collection of archive material ever shown. Much of it, hitherto unpublished, reveal who Hitler was and how he could become what he was. A notorious liar and an unscrupulous murderer. Hitler's power and popularity are unquestioned. And Göring, the second man in the state, is similarly popular as well, if not as close to the Fuhrer as others. Hitler has created a secret private life and spends a lot of time in the Alps at Obersalzberg, which is declared a restricted area. Hitler threatens to invade Austria. The Austrian Chancellor surrenders, allowing the country to be taken over. In a subsequent plebiscite, nearly 100% of Austrians vote in favor of integration into the German Reich. This success encourages Hitler to repeat this tactic with Czechoslovakia, where a substantial German minority lives in the Sudetenland. Will he succeed again? Has anything like the Third Reich ever existed before? Among the phenomenon that I have personally come across in my lifetime, Islam, the Mohammedan world and worldview, comes closest. The word Islam means devotion. It is the same thing as what is expressed by raising one's hand in the Nazi salute in the Third Reich. I am yours in life and in death. Islam is the higher ideal of the two, because it is nobler to serve God than a country or a race. Karen Tanya Blixen, Danish writer. He has managed to captivate his people using a mystical band that is not even dependent on the National Socialist Party that helped him into power. I often have the opportunity to experience this, indeed, in all social circles. Robert Coulondre, French ambassador to Berlin, 1938 and 1939. Hitler's rule uses an aesthetic of overwhelming to bind the masses to the system. In the early days of his movement, well-organized and choreographed mass marches imply a strength which is in fact non-existent. After the seizure of power, he employs uniforms, dramaturgy, lighting effects known as cathedrals of light, and military pomp to amalgamate and unify the hurriedly summoned masses to a picture of strength, power and violence. Of the facts themselves, there was no doubt. He had restored to Germany her self-respect, and recreated orderliness out of the chaos and distress which had followed her defeat in 1918. Neville Henderson, British ambassador to Germany. The year 1937 is the quietest of Hitler's 12-year reign. There are no foreign policy provocations, no new racist laws, no publicly staged pogroms. 
If one were to believe the footage shot by amateur filmmakers who come from the upper middle class, the people in Hitler's Reich enjoy their lives. <laughs> For Hitler, driving is now only possible on the motorways, where the stewards are strictly prohibited from informing anyone on route or in the neighboring villages by phone. Otherwise, he would have to fly or travel by train. But to pay a lady a private visit in Munich, or anywhere else for that matter, is completely impossible. Henry Picker, senior executive officer, table talk at the Volkschanzerführer headquarters. When you meet the Germans, you will probably think they are very much like us. They look like us. Except that there are fewer of the wiry type and more big, fleshy, fair-haired men and women, especially in the north. But they are not really so much like us as they look. Instructions for British servicemen in Germany, 1944. Germany report of the German Social Democratic Party, March the 12th, 1938. Inasmuch as the attitude of a whole nation can be summed up in a single formula, one could say something like, Hitler has the consent of the majority of people in two essential questions. He has created employment and made Germany strong. There is a great deal of dissatisfaction with the prevailing conditions, which, however, only applies to the worries of everyday life and in most people, has not led to fundamental opposition to the regime. Heinrich Himmler visits Quedlinburg in the Prussian province of Saxony. In the medieval city, he propagates a cult around King Henry I, for Himmler, the founder of the German Reich. The king is buried in Quedlinburg Castle. The Reichsführer SS has been head of the German police in the Reich Ministry of the Interior since June 1936. Client conversation in Nuremberg, 1945. Göring. To the outside world, it looked like I was the second man in the government. But after 1942, my influence decreased. Question. Who were your rivals for power? Göring. Himmler, later Bormann. Hermann Göring to his lawyer, Hermann Bruss. When he had to make big decisions, he went up to Obersalzberg. Here, life was geared to his personal needs. Strolls around Obersalzberg, stopping in small guest houses, gave him, as he said, the inner peace and confidence to make the decisions that surprised the world. Albert Speer. Diary, September the 18th, 1938. Drive to the tea house up on the mountain. It stands majestically in the midst of giant peaks. An undisturbed view. Here, one finds clarity and confidence. All the ballast of Berlin disappears. Joseph Goebbels. The entire Obersalzberg area is sealed off in 1935. Hitler asks Martin Bormann to pressure the house and hotel owners into selling their property to the NSDAP to create a so-called Führer security zone. Meanwhile, it had become a custom for everyone who wanted to see their Führer to gather there in the afternoon. An aide gave the signal, and then everyone marched down the hill past Hitler, a touching spectacle of spontaneous tribute. For them, it was one of the biggest moments of their lives. Fritz Wiedemann, adjutant to Adolf Hitler. One beautiful day, my school friends and I decided to visit Obersalzberg. Suddenly, Hitler appeared in front of his Berghof residence and greeted the lines of people. When we students from Munich reached where he was, an aide ran down. He told us, the Führer wants to greet you. We followed him to the Berghof. 
Hitler stood there and shook our hands. He asked, Do you want to have tea with me? We found that really exciting, and we were led onto the terrace. Elizabeth Nuller Neumann, student in Munich. Adolf Hitler invited a circle of people to Orbe Salzburg who were not selected for their politics. He chose those who were agreeable to him and would not disturb his thoughts with political discussions. <laughs> Thus, the circle was made up of artists, some women, Fräulein Braun, mostly the secretaries, the personal and army adjutants, Ambassador Hevel, Sepp Dietrich, Professor Morell, Essa, and their wives. Borman, Brandt and I were also members of this circle. Albert Speer. Usually, straight after dinner, there would be a discussion. After that, there was a stroll to the little tea house, half an hour's walk away from the Berghof. Hitler led the way with the honored guests. The others followed far enough behind to be out of earshot. The party met again on a plateau beneath the tea house that had a wide view of the Alps. The way back to the Berghof was always by car. Christa Schröder, Hitler's private secretary. Hermann Göring does not belong to Hitler's private circle, although he owns a residence on Obersalzberg too. Hitler maintains no private relationship with him. The same is true of Heinrich Himmler and of Ribbentrop, whom Hitler appoints as foreign minister in February 1938, yet excludes him from his private life around Berghof. <laughs> Even as Hitler's deputy, I always had to restrain myself because I often didn't know about plans and projects. In secret it was determined, and in 1936 then disclosed to the ministers that I would be considered the Führer's successor. Nevertheless, the Führer often did not inform me about important actions. Hermann Göring, conversation with Hermann Bross, Nuremberg, 1945. Waldschanze, Führer Headquarters. Lunch, October the 27th, 1941. The Reich Foreign Secretary is at present hunting pheasant in Sudetenland. This fact once again gave the Führer cause to pour scorn on the royal hunt. All his sympathies are on the side of the poachers, because first of all, these people must really understand something about hunting, and secondly, without the poachers, the most beautiful novels would never have been written. Werner Kirpen, Adjutant to Reich Minister Alfred Rosenblum. He didn't drink a drop of alcohol, never ate meat, didn't smoke. His asceticism was real and not artificial. Hans Frank, Reich legal director. He ate only vegetarian dishes, usually an enormous plate of carrots, peas, asparagus, onions, leeks, sliced kohlrabi and potatoes, all mixed up together in a thick white sauce. Sefton Delmer, British correspondent for the Daily Express in Berlin. One of those present asked his personal physician whether the health of the Reich Chancellor forced him to keep such a strict diet. And he answered that his Spartan habits were mainly for psychological reasons. Gustav Mannerheim, Finnish Field Marshal. Apart from its state dinners, his table manners were uncultivated. 
Reinhard Spitzi, Personal Assistant to Joachim von Ribbentrop. Incidentally, the Führer try to spoil the meat eaters' enjoyment of their meal. Although he didn't want to convert anyone to vegetarianism, he suddenly began talking about how awful it was walking through an abattoir. Gertraud Traudeljunge, Hitler's private secretary. After the meal, there was black coffee, but nothing to smoke. Tobacco was banned from the entire chancellery, even in the toilets. Reinhard Spitzi. Enjoying meat, he said, triggered a desire for alcohol. And then again, alcohol stimulated smoking. And this was how one vice led to another. Nicotine was, in his opinion, even worse than alcohol. He actually toyed with the idea of totally banning smoking throughout Germany. The campaign would start with a skull and crossbones printed on the cigarette packet. Christa Schröder. Diary, January the 11th, 1938. Second air raid drill. We learned how to use gas masks. Henrietta Schneider. drill at a factory against an attack with conventional and chemical weapons in Brunswick. Founded in April 1939, the Reich Luftschutzbund, or State Air Shelter League, unites all air raid activities. At the lowest level, it consists of volunteers from local communities and, at the municipal level, the fire brigades. In 1939, 15 million people are brought together in the Luftschutzbund. During the war, the air raid community is mainly formed of older men and single women. The Führer had at this time something like the power of Napoleon after Austerlitz and Jena. Winston Churchill, member of the British Parliament. Seefeld in Tyrol on the day the Wehrmacht enter Austria. The Austrian NSDAP has been banned since 1933 for terrorist activities. Previously, they had received on average less than 25% of the vote at regional elections, but in some cities such as Innsbruck, more than 40%. On July the 25th, 1934, the Austrian National Socialists tried to stage a coup and failed. Already in July 1936, however, the National Socialists imprisoned in Austria were pardoned. The activities of the party were tolerated and it gained support, especially in Carinthia and Styria. As far back as I can remember, the rise of Hitler in the powerful country next door cast a threatening shadow over us. Egon Schwartz, Austrian Jewish high school student in Vienna. People knew about Dachau and Oranienburg. They didn't like to talk about it. Kurt Schuschnigg, Austrian Chancellor. Apart from his resolve to bring all Teutonic races into the Reich, as so plainly described in Mein Kampf, Hitler had two reasons for wishing to absorb the Austrian Republic. It opened both the door of Czechoslovakia and the more spacious portals of southeastern Europe to Germany. Winston Churchill, the Second World War. Führer's order, March the 11th, 1938, 8.45 p.m. Operation Otto. The demands of the German ultimatum to the Austrian government have not been fulfilled. To avoid further bloodshed in Austrian towns, the march of the German armed forces into Austria will commence at daybreak on March the 12th. Adolf Hitler. On Friday the 11th of March, 1938, 
Austrian radio broadcast a program of light music. It was 7.45 in the evening when the announcer suddenly interrupted. The Chancellor was going to speak. Kurt Schuschnigg said that in order to avoid bloodshed, he would capitulate to Hitler's wishes. He ended his speech with the words, God protect Austria. Dr. Eva Bloch, the Hitler's family doctor, written in US exile, March the 15th, 1941. Diary, Sunday, March the 13th, 1938. In the evening, the announcement of the new law for Austria, issued by the Führer in Linz. Adolf Hitler is now also the commander-in-chief of all troops in Austria. Henrietta Schneider. If it is still claimed today that Hitler occupied Austria against the will of the Austrians, that doesn't coincide with my observations. Fritz Wiedemann, adjutant to Adolf Hitler. It is correct to say that a very large number of Austrians were gladly prepared to accept National Socialism and integration into the German Reich. This number is made up of all those who were disappointed with the politics of compromise of previous years and who doubted that Austria would be able to hold out against National Socialism. Those who expected liberation from what they called clericalism and above all those who felt threatened by the Jewish menace. Ernst Rüdiger Stahenberg, leader of the Austrian Home Guard from March 1938 in exile. Women, especially, enjoy decorating themselves with the emblems of National Socialism that they wore as medallions or brooches. By contrast, there was terror and fear among the opponents of National Socialism. The fear was particularly acute among the Jews and led to hasty actions and suicides. Egon Bosch, St. Pölten, German-Austrian Jew. Diary, Tuesday, March the 15th, 1938. We listened to the Führer around 11 o'clock. You asked yourself, can it be possible that we have become a great unified Reich without a war? In the evening, Kurt Riever's engagement appeared in the newspaper. Henrietta Schneider. Hitler's speech from a balcony of the Habsburg Palace. As Führer and Chancellor of the German nation and Reich, I report before history the entry of my homeland into the German Reich. March the 25th, 1938, Hitler begins the last election campaign of his life. Hitler wants to confirm the annexation of Austria in a referendum. He estimates 80% will vote in favour of it in Austria. With a public information form, the population in what is now the Greater German Reich is informed how and above all where they should mark their crosses in the plebiscite. <laughs> Um dass Sie keinen Fehler machen, werde ich Ihnen drinnen im Stimmlokal alles erklären. Also jetzt passen Sie gut auf. 
Der Herr, der dort hinter dem Tisch sitzt, das ist der Wahlleiter. Zudem gehen Sie hin und sagen Ihren Namen und Ihre Adresse und zeigen ihm Ihr Dokument. Josef Berghofer, Hauptstraße 43. Sehen Sie, einer der Beisitzer schaut jetzt nach, ob der Wähler in der Stimmliste enthalten ist. 412. Jetzt bekommt der Wähler einen Stimmzettel und einen Briefumschlag, mit dem er dort in die Stimmzelle geht. In der Stimmzelle macht man da mit dem Bleistift in den großen Kreis, bei dem ein Ja steht, ein Kreuz. Und in den großen Kreis, bei dem ein Ja steht, ein Kreuz. Das ist sehr wichtig und legt den Stimmzettel in den Briefumschlag. Auf dem Stimmzettel darf nichts anderes vermerkt werden, als nur das Kreuz in dem Ja-Kreis, sonst ist der Stimmzettel ungültig. Den Briefumschlag mit dem Stimmzettel übergibt man dann dem Wahlleiter, der ihn ungeöffnet in die Wahlurne legt. Dankeschön. Ist das alles? Na, eigentlich nicht. Denn nachher, wenn Sie abgestimmt haben, müssen Sie nach Hause gehen und dafür sorgen, dass auch alle Ihre Bekannten rechtzeitig zur Abstimmung kommen. Hitler estimates 80% will vote in favor of it in Austria. He's more than surprised when on the evening of April the 10th, the referendum results are announced. 99.75% have voted for the Anschluss, more than in the Old Reich. Election Day in Schwetzingen, 10 kilometers west of Heidelberg. On April the 10th, 1938, in combination with the plebiscite on the annexation of Austria to the German Reich, an election for the now Greater German Reichstag takes place. Between November 1933 and April 1938, Adolf Hitler calls three elections for the German Reichstag, which has been disempowered by the Enabling Act. These elections to his pseudo-parliament are fixed and anything but free. They do not say anything about the support of Germans for Hitler's policies. For example, unmarked ballots are considered as being in favor. Germans of Jewish descent and so-called Jewish half-breeds lost the right to vote in 1935. Between March 1933 and April 1942, Hitler convenes the powerless parliament to confirm his policies just 19 times. As it turned out in the great German vote, all the staff in Paul Zollnice's house, from the chauffeur to the chambermaids, are party members. Everyone is reeling from the euphoria that occurs with the typical signs of an epidemic. Even those far away are exposed to the contagion. Frank Thies, German writer, fragments of historical experiences. All laws enacted before then, including the Jewish acts that were passed in 1935 in Nuremberg and later strengthened and significantly extended, would be transferred at once and with full force to the new territory and its entire state and social life turned upside down overnight. Egon Schwartz, Austrian Jewish high school student in Vienna, later historian. A march passed in Lower Austria to mark May the 1st. Austria's Social Democrats had won more than 40% of the votes in the last three National Council elections. The National Socialists tried to win over the Social Democrat supporters who, in the form of the Schutzbund, had once fought street battles with the SA. Hermann Neubacher, National Socialist, Mayor of Vienna since April the 12th, 1938. Former members of the Schutzbund, we understand you. You believed, as we also believe. You stood up for it, as we did during difficult years. You were revolutionaries, as are we. Today we extend our hand. Are you prepared to work with us faithfully? And until the very last? Then I accept your vow. To our great Führer, Sieg Heil. summer at Lake Atta in the Salzkammergut resort. The middle class have also come to terms with the Anschluss, which has been overwhelmingly promoted in mass initiatives and propaganda campaigns. The Catholic German nationalism of the Christian social movement, dominant up until 1938, facilitates the abandonment of almost all resistance.
Hitler has imprisoned the leading politicians of the Ständestaat, the corporate class state, as, for example, the mayor of Vienna, Richard Schmitz, and ex-chancellor Kurt Schuschnigg. May 26, 1938. I have requested permission to emigrate. I feel that I have to leave Germany before it is too late. War seems unavoidable. It will, I fear, encompass all of Europe, if not the whole world. Bella Fromm, German Jewish journalist. Membership in the Hitler Youth ends at the age of 18 in the Federation of German Girls at 17. Hitler had appointed von Schirach Reich Youth Leader in 1931 at the age of 24. At that time, the leading cadres of the Hitler Youth were hardly older than those entrusted to them. According to Hitler's instruction, youth should be led by youth. The National Revolution is undoubtedly a youth movement. The new Germany is being built by the young for the young. The military discipline, which serves as a backdrop to the present drama, provides remarkable contrasts. Anthony Count Zubansky, Polish writer. In 1938, in a revised version of the Marriage Act, conceiving children is defined as the purpose of marriage. The refusal of a spouse is considered grounds for divorce, but the National Socialists cannot stop the long-term trend towards smaller families. The average size of household and family continues to shrink in the years 1933 to 1945. In 1920, there was an average of 2.3 children per marriage. In 1930, 2.2, and in 1940, only 1.8 children. Hitler is driven by the notion that he will only be granted a short life. Note of a Hitler speech to NSDAP propaganda leaders. He, Hitler, did not have much longer to live, according to human estimates. People did not grow old in his family. It was therefore necessary to solve the problems as soon as possible so that this would happen during his lifetime. Only he was able to do this. Waldemar Vogt, provincial propaganda leader, Mein <laughs> Franconia. My personal last will and testament, in the case of my death, I dispose that my remains be buried in the right-hand temple of the eternal guardhouse. My coffin should resemble the others, that my entire estate be left to the party, to Fräulein Eva Braun, Munich, a lifelong allowance of 1,000 marks per month. To my sister Angela Dresden, a lifelong allowance of 1,000 marks per month. To my sister Paula, Vienna, a lifelong allowance of 1,000 marks per month. To my stepbrother Alois Hitler, the lump sum of 60,000 marks. To my trusted Julius Schalk, the lump sum of 10,000 marks and a lifelong monthly pension of 500 marks. I appoint the Master of the Treasury as executor of this testament. In the case of his death, Martin Bormann. Berlin, May the 2nd, 1938. Adolf Hitler. Krapau lies near the German border. Whenever we came up to the border, several in the group broke away, ran across the borderline, and kissed the German earth. Later, I learned that these children were ethnic Germans who were raised to love Germany. Ruth Elias, Czech Jew. The history of the Sudeten German liberation movement is closely linked to Adolf Hitler's National Socialism. Although we were never allowed to have a shared organization with the National Socialists and the Reich for political and foreign policy reasons, 
No artificial barriers could prevent the spirit of Adolf Hitler from attracting ever larger masses of Sudeten Germans. Swastika flags flew on the streets of Sudeten German districts and cities. The marching columns of a faithful German youth, devoted unto death, broke the Marxist rule of violence. Hans Krebs, German National Socialist Workers' Party of Czechoslovakia, MP. Diary, Monday, September the 12th, 1938. In the evening, we heard the close of the party convention in Nuremberg. Adolf Hitler called on President Benesch. If the Sudeten Germans are not protected, we know what we have to do. God preserve the existing peace. Diary, Thursday, September the 15th, 1938. My 66th birthday. England's Prime Minister Chamberlain is with the Führer today. I had many guests. Henrietta Schneider. The British Prime Minister made a really good impression on our people. But unfortunately, he wasn't the right man for Hitler. He was too kind and decent. One should have found a different negotiating partner for Hitler. A bulldog like Churchill or a hard-headed colonial general. A negotiator like that would have made more of an impression than benign Uncle Chamberlain with his umbrella. Reinhard Spitzi, personal assistant to Joachim von Ribbentrop. Speech in the Berlin Sportpalast, September the 26th, 1938. I also want to declare now, before the German people, that with respect to the Sudeten German problem, my patience is now exhausted. I have made Mr. Benesch an offer, peace or war. Either he finally gives the Germans their freedom, or we will come and take this freedom ourselves. Adolf Hitler. Tuesday, September the 27th, 1938. Hitler spoke to the German people last night. If Benesch doesn't accept his offer, we'll move in on October the 1st. That means war. Henrietta Schneider. There were various different tones to these discussions. Hitler found friendly words of recognition for Chamberlain, and Lotus spoke the oft-quoted sentence, We don't want any Czechs. Paul Otto Schmidt, interpreter for Adolf Hitler. Diary, Wednesday, September the 28th, 1938. Tomorrow, a meeting in Munich between Hitler, Daladier, Chamberlain and Mussolini. Henrietta Schneider. In spite of the harshness and ruthlessness I thought I saw in his face, I got the impression that here was a man who could be relied upon when he had given his word. Neville Chamberlain, British Prime Minister, letter to his sister. Diary, Friday, September the 30th, 1938. The negotiations in Munich have had a happy ending. The Czechs have to pull out of the Sudetenland tomorrow. Hitler, our Prince of Peace. Henrietta Schneider. The genius of the Führer and his determination not to shrink, even in the face of war, have again achieved victory without the use of force. Alfred Jodl. Letter to Elizabeth Wagner, October the 9th, 1938. The occupation is going smoothly. Unfortunately, we've swallowed 500,000 Czechs. Eduard Wagner, Colonel in the General Staff.
the increasingly heady atmosphere of the days of the occupation has already ebbed away. Nevertheless, one has to say that National Socialism has been accepted everywhere. Soon after the occupation, we received letters from relatives of refugees, mostly comrades, that clearly showed that they too had been convinced by National Socialism. Germany report of the German Social Democratic Party, December the 10th, 1938. Everyone concurs that the Munich Agreement is Hitler's victory. But Hitler himself sees it as a defeat. He would have preferred to gain what he's achieved by force rather than peacefully. Sudeten German Diary, October the 19th, 1938. On the order of our Führer, we've been able to occupy a new piece of Germany for Germany. We were all prepared to give our best, including our lives, for this task. Benno von Arendt, Reich Set Designer, Reserve Officer. Protocol of Interrogations in Berlin Gestapo Office, November the 21st, 1939, 8.30 a.m. In autumn 1938, the working class generally expected a war. After the Munich Agreement, the working class was quiet again. I was already convinced last year that the Munich Agreement would not hold and that war was unavoidable. George Elsa, failed assassin of Hitler in November 1939. On Monday, November the 7th, 1938, the stateless 17-year-old Jewish boy Grunspan goes to the German embassy, demands to speak with one of the councillors, is taken to the duty councillor von Rath and shoots him. Grunspan describes the motive for the act as wanting to take revenge for his fellow believers, for the Polish Jews forced out of Germany. Walter Tausk, German Jew, Wroclaw, diary. In Munich, the Putsch of 1923 was celebrated with great pomp. The SS marched through all over the city. The radio announced the death of the diplomat. Edgar Fuchswanger, German Jewish neighbor of Adolf Hitler. Die Feierlichkeiten am 9. November in München fanden ihren Abschluss mit der Vereidigung der SS-Anwärter auf dem Platz vor der Feldherrnhalle in Anwesenheit des Führers. traditional march to the Feldherrnhalle, at a social evening of NS party leaders and old comrades, Josef Goebbels announces the death of Ernst vom Rath.
I go to the party reception in the old town hall. Very busy. I report the matter to the Führer. He orders... Withdraw the police. The Jews should for once feel the people's anger. Josef Goebbels, diary. It was clear to me that something would happen outside in the Reich. I believe that the saying, the Jews will pay for this, was widely misunderstood. Hartmann Lauterbacher, deputy leader, Hitler Youth. Diary, November 1938. In the night that brings the news of the death, a pogrom breaks out all over Germany. All the synagogues are on fire, windows are smashed in all the Jewish shops, the wares destroyed. Apartments are broken into. Thousands of Jewish men are arrested and locked up in concentration camps. Kita Kolwitz, painter and sculptress. The synagogue in Esslingen in Württemberg is plundered by residents of the town on the afternoon of November the 10th. Religious artifacts are burned. Hermann screamed hysterically. These damn idiots! I have to collect every old bucket and every old newspaper in Germany, and then a horde of hooligans goes around and destroys things worth millions in one evening. My concern was the methods that the regime was using to deal with its political opponents. I was deeply shocked, and I said to Hermann, fate has blessed your party so. Don't sin. Emmy Göring, Historical Events and Confessions. When that segment of the population that had not taken part, either as police or SA, awoke after the fatal night and saw the destruction that had taken place, a sequence unfolded that its instigators had not expected. An unmistakable, deep sense of depression and shame seized the public. People said, I'm ashamed to be a German. Rudolf Bing, German-Jewish businessman, Nuremberg. November the 10th, 1938. Meeting in the Ministry of Aviation. Goering again openly expressed his reluctance, but nevertheless issued an abundance of repulsive regulations. Things like Jews should not visit theatres, museums and beach resorts and shouldn't drive cars. Goering said himself in the meeting, he wouldn't want to live in Germany as a Jew anymore. Hans Kerr, official in charge of special tasks in the economics ministry, memoirs. As with the Night of the Long Knives, we considered the Kristallnacht to be an unavoidable peripheral phenomenon of the otherwise accepted national socialist seizure of power, which only now began to reveal its revolutionary character. Rudolf Wolters, architect, employee of Albert Speer. Entering public parks is forbidden to Viennese Jews, along with the Schönbrunn Palace Gardens. In the districts of the German Ostmark, as in the rest of the German Reich, the Nuremberg race laws apply. Between March 1938 and May 1939 alone, 100,000 Austrians of Jewish descent leave their home country, with most having to abandon almost all their property. By 1942, another 30,000 will emigrate or flee. Jews in Berlin applies to all theatres, cinemas, cabarets, concert and lecture halls, museums, fairs, the radio tower, the Deutschlandhalle and the Sportpalast. In addition, all outdoor and indoor swimming pools 
as well as from Wilhelmstraße and Vossstraße to the Reich Monument and the Zeughaus. Erich Ebermeier, writer. Harassed by the Nazi authorities, around 120,000 German and Austrian Jews succeed in leaving their homeland by the beginning of the Second World War. I used my final days in Germany to bid farewell to my old homeland. With my children, I walked through the spring, along the old familiar paths through the forests and fields, where every tree and every house had associations. Never again in my life would I walk on these paths. A man comes along, the Führer of 80 million people, and declares that Jews can't have a home that Jews are a nomadic people who can never settle, who always need to roam. Hugo Moses, German-Jewish owner of the Progress Factory, Cologne. 